Welcome to our webinar on how U.S. tax reforms are changing the world of BEPS and today's business models. The webinar will address the context of the U.S. tax reform, the major international tax provision impacting inbound and outbound companies, the potential impacts of tax changes on business models, and also some practical implications for global ETR planning. The presenters for today are going to be Raymond Gerardum, Managing Partner and CFO at TPA Global in the Netherlands, Kevin Kiernan, TPA Global Member in the US, and Sim Lowell, Counsel at McDermott, Will & Emery in the US. Should you have any questions during the webinar, please type it into the question chart box and we will answer you at the end of the presentation. Dear Raymond, I give you the floor. Thank you, Gaia. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. As Gaia was saying, what we are trying to do is to give you an overview of what are the U.S. tax reform's key components that have an impact on, uh, on both uh, U.S. outbound uh, companies as well as multinationals going inbound into the U.S. What we're not trying to do is to give you a very technical, technical um, uh, assessment of um, uh, those new rules, but we try to make them more practical uh, and hopefully we are successful in um, in delivering that. Um, can we get the next slides, um, Gaia? Okay, you must have all followed, uh, you know, very extensively all the news that was going around at the uh, latter part of last year when Mr. Trump was trying to get his uh, tax reform through. Um, there was a lot of speculation of what is happening on uh, the tax impacts for multinationals. On this page, you see an overview that came out of the Financial Times uh, on the 21st of December, where the majority of companies was assumed to be making quite some extra margin through uh, a lowering of the tax rate. And um, some were you know, penalized, apparently, the utility companies. Uh, that was at the status at that point in time. If you go to the next slide, uh, please, Gaia. Apple was obviously, you know, very much on the front where there was a, an expectation that there is 47 billion of tax that is going to be coming back uh, to uh, Apple as a, as a windfall profit. Um, needless to say, if that is on the repatriated profit, people will probably know today that that will be a function of what is the deferred position on the reserves that are outside of the U.S., whether they were yes or no already accounted for in a tax liability at that point in time. But essentially what people were calculating, if repatriation takes place at 40% versus 14 and a half, as it was still at that point in time, that would give quite a significant benefit in a one-off on the repatriated profits to Apple. We'll come back to that. Can I get the next slide, please? Finance groups. Um, again, there was a lot of speculation and you know, probably some truth nowadays in terms of what is the impact that finance uh, institutions have uh, with the change in the tax rate to the extent they had losses in the past during the financial crisis. Some of them had significant losses. Uh, those losses are typically booked as a deferred tax asset to the extent they can sustain that position. And as a result, those tax assets were built with still the old tax rates in mind, noting that obviously the rate goes down uh, to 21 percent. The value of those losses has significantly reduced, if not almost halved. And that's what we see here. And we see that in actual uh, truth that the number of these finance institutions indeed are taking one off hits as part of a reduction in the deferred tax asset relating to net operating losses of the past. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? Uh, here is some history of ETRs where we see when the rate is coming down, the top line rate, obviously the corporate tax uh, revenue to the uh, to the government is also dropping. Uh, but funny enough, the impact of such a rate reduction has not necessarily seen an increase in gross business investments, which is obviously one of the political statements made by the Trump administration, that by lowering the tax rate, we will see a lot of more investments coming in to the US. Um, this seems to contradict that statement. And obviously, that was one of the controversies, obviously, in the whole uh, 
uh, process of getting the tax reforms uh, through as well for Mr. Trump. Um, okay, we need to still see what the future will hold, but this was again one of the elements that people were looking at, whether that would be holding true, yes or no. Can we go to the next slide, please? Another one that is um, that was speculated on, and we can now see that it indeed is going to have some impact. Um, multinational insurers that are doing business in the U.S., uh, in other words, insure risk in the U.S., they typically have structures whereby their capital is in a central hub outside of the U.S., um, and that is done for regulatory capital efficiency management purposes, so nothing to do necessarily with tax. As a result, because they are keeping this risk capital outside of the U.S., they typically put in retrocessions. In other words, the risk is effectively retroceded outside of the U.S. into the logical hub they have. And as a result, there will be charges going into the U.S. because those payments need to go out and the risk needs to be rewarded. Uh, so premium income is effectively leaving the U.S. and going to the national uh, national home where the capital sits. In the future with BEAT, which is one of the elements we will be discussing later on, any payments outside of the U.S. to related parties can become subject to another withholding style tax or an assessment of tax. Uh, and that might trigger a whole new picture of how multinational non-US based uh, insurance companies will structure their business models and their operations within the US. Can we get to the next slide, please? Uh, what we have done here, and this is by no means trying to be complete, but as we said at the start, we want to be a bit practical. And what we have tried to do is to sort of carve out the elements that trigger one-offs and the elements that have a future impact on profits. And in particular, to what extent do they impact the effective tax rate of a multinational? If we look at the one-offs, and we saw some of those, if a company was looking at a net deferred tax assets in its books, read the banks who had net operating losses of the past, carried at a high interest rate, uh, sorry, at a high uh, tax rate, that value of the DTA is going down because the rate is now lower. And that has obviously an upward trend on the on the ETR. So they will see, at least during the first time that they have to report this lower value of the DTA, they see an increase on their ETR for that year. Uh, the reverse is true if companies have already created some DTLs at the 40% roughly uh, rate, now having a 20% rate or 21% to be correct, that DTL is having a lower value and that reversely will also help to improve the effective tax rate. If we think about uh, reserves that are outside of the US, so this is specific to US uh, companies that have outbound business and that have effectively reserves parked outside and deferred. Uh, the big question is, what is the impact on ETR? Uh, and this is a function, for instance, for, for Apple. Um, if they have booked uh, a deferred tax liability uh, on those reserves for repatriation purposes at the 40% rate, and now it's 21, their DTL value will go uh, down, which means the ETR will be benefited from that. If they have no DTL on it, obviously ETR will increase because they will have a deemed repatriation, whether they want it or not. And that has a direct impact on the ETR for those reserves that qualify for this deemed repatriation model. If we look at future profits, and that's probably the more interesting one, uh, the introduction of a territorial system may have an impact going up or down. It very much depends on what the underlying rates are, uh, what is the deferral uh, capability in today's world versus the future. So this is to be seen. I personally think it might help still uh, to keep um, uh, the, the rate down, but it very much depends. Uh, 
guilty. Uh, Kevin will talk about what that all means. It is really about US-based companies that have business outside where they are basically taking um, uh, IP income at a low tax rate. Uh, and if that goes be above certain thresholds, it has an impact because there is a, a calculation that forces then the income to be allocated back to the US and taxed in the US, which has obviously an impact on the ETR driving it up. FDII is the reverse. If there is income coming in on intellectual property into the US, there is a, a preferred way of looking at that income, which helps to bring the rate down uh, in the US. Uh, there was even a company today or the last week that announced that they have a, an effective tax rate expectation for financial year 18 of 9%. Uh, it's a pharmaceutical company, a US-based pharmaceutical company. So it's quite remarkable that maybe this FDI impact might be there, plus some other elements on the, on the one-offs most likely. Um, but anyway, so FDI will help to reduce your ETR. BEAT, on the other hand, is for multinationals based outside of the US who are charging into uh, US subsidiaries or related companies. And if you go over certain thresholds, again, this, uh, if it applies, it will has an impact on the ETR that drives ETR up again. So this is sort of giving you uh, a bit of the high level picture. Uh, hopefully that helps. And now we go into the next slide, please. And I think this is for you, Sim. Uh, thank you, Raymond. It, the 2017 Act reflects uh, the U.S. Congress's view of how to handle global competitiveness issues and implementation of BEPS in, in a way that uh, suits the interests of the United States. When we look at the elements that Raymond just looked at and Kevin will be talking about in detail in a few minutes, um, it certainly appears that the U.S. has taken unilateral action with respect to uh, the BEPS type reforms, but of course that's consistent with what we see in other countries with the diverted profits tax in the UK and Australia, equalization levies, the EU reforms, and whatnot. Um, so it's interesting that from a tax planner standpoint, the BEPS things that all pointed in various directions, and now we're seeing uh, countries around the world going in their own unilateral directions, which makes the world for us planners are, are very complicated and for companies to reassess their effective tax planning strategies. Um, as, as Raymond said, the Act has elements of coordination with other countries, incentives for domestic U.S. economic activity, and the sharing of deemed non-routine returns with other countries. That guilty provision is very interesting, as Kevin will indicate. So the as at a high level, again, there's a move to a territorial system that the U.S. system, as, as I'll indicate in a second, is uh, entirely different than the territorial systems in other countries. It also has a deemed repatriation that Raymond mentioned in terms of Apple. Guy, the next slide, please. Um, in terms of taxation of intangible income, we have the two elements: the guilty provision. Um, uh, which in effect repatriates to the U.S. a portion of non-routine income earned offshore is an interesting way of implementing, a, in essence, a profit split mechanism in, in the sense of sharing that deemed non-routine return, uh, in, in essence, half of the U.S. and half of the country in which it's earned. And again, Kevin will go through the details of that in a few minutes. The incentive for domestic investment is... is practically 13.125%, which is attractive, um, but also, as Raymond indicated, we're already saying that in some contexts that may produce an even lower um, rate. The final thing let me note is that um, um, the, these U.S. provisions are intended to be subject to treaty discussion. That's not necessarily the case with other unilateral actions, such, such as a diverted profits tax um, in the UK and Australia. Guy, how about going to the next slide? In terms of the territorial system, um, 
at, at a high level, the U.S. is following the trend in other countries of having a territorial regime, um, but it preserves the existing so-called controlled foreign corporation provisions and other elements so that it, it is very much a hybrid territorial system. Um, in essence, as I look at it, it, it's coming up with a quasi-consolidation um, on a global basis with a variety of different elements that uh, will we'll certainly touch the high points of those today, but for each group, as Raymond indicated, um, it simply needs to go through um, a careful planning exercise. The territorial system in the U.S. is implemented by <clears throat> a dividends received deduction, which is 100%, as opposed to some other countries. With respect to dividends that come from 10% uh, or greater uh, foreign corporations with that ownership being in, U in U.S. persons. There's no foreign tax credit, and as I said, the controlled foreign corporation provisions re remain, and it is effective for years beginning um, after December 31st. Uh, Guy, how about going on the next slide? The deemed repatriation provisions that uh, Raymond already mentioned are, are noted on this slide, and it, all it does is in, in effect is to um, create um, a, a lowered rate of tax on those deferred tax assets of U.S.-based companies. And, and Guy, if you go to the next slide. Gaia? Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Um, in, in effect, it has a, a two rates of tax, a 15.5% rate on foreign cash positions and 8% on other kinds um, of assets. So that's the a high level of the U.S. provisions and the territorial tax. Now let's go through the, the details of the guilty FDII and uh, base erosion provisions. Uh, Kevin and Guy, how about going to the next slide? Next slide. Thanks, Sam. So on, on this slide, what we wanted to do at the outset in, in talking about uh, two of these new provisions, the guilty and, and the FDII, is to is to see that they're both, you know, they're both really focused on the taxation of of intangible income. Um, so both both provisions operate in a similar way and are geared toward taxing what the services come up with or the treasury has come up with as non-routine or deemed intangible income returns. So global intangible low tax income or guilty is intended to assure that the U.S. that there's a minimum tax paid in the U.S. on non-routine returns of U.S. owned CFCs earned in a low tax context. This is accomplished with the deemed inclusion of guilty income, similar to the current subpart F provisions. However, in order to get to this, you know, sharing or reduced tax rate, the inclusion is coupled with a new deduction, uh, initially at 50% for guilty income. We'll cover the guilty in, in more detail later, and we've also provided in, in some of the later slides a, a high-level example of the guilty calculation. The second new provision, also geared towards non-routine or deemed intangible returns, is the foreign-derived intangible income provision, or what I will refer to as FIDI. This is also this is a beneficial provision intended to incentivize U.S. corporations that directly earn foreign-derived intangible income. And again, the beneficial rate on FIDI is also accomplished by providing a deduction initially equal to 37.5% of the, of the FIDI income. Uh, both, both of these provisions share a common approach in defining a routine return or, or what is called the deemed tangible income return, while the residual non-routine or deemed intangible return is essentially everything in excess of the deemed intangible income return. So again, there's, there's really no linkage here to you know, the 482 rules or OECD concepts of, of transfer pricing. It's really 
you know, an approach where this, where we really just defined that a baseline return on tangible is the is the routine return, and then everything else is the is the deemed intang intangible return. So both provisions, uh, in looking at the deemed tangible return, are looking at uh, tangible assets and providing a 10% return on those tangible assets. Uh, to be eligible, the, you know, the qualified business assets must be used in the trade of business, subject to depreciation allowable under 167. And for CFCs, the tax basis would be determined using straight line depreciation under Section 168's alternate uh, depreciation system. Uh, next slide. All right, so the, so the Act adds new code section 951A, which would require a U.S. shareholder of a CFC to include an income its annual guilty amount, and as I said, in a manner similar to subpart F. Uh, guilty income would have its own separate uh, FTC basket. And then how do, we, how do we determine the guilty inclusion? So there's some new formulas that have come into play. Guilty is going to be the amount by which the net CFC tested income exceeds the net deemed intangible income return. And the net CFC tested income will be the aggregate amount of the, of the shareholders uh, pro rata share of tested income of, its, of, of all of its CFCs over the tested losses of, the, of CFCs. And so here we're basically looking at CFC's gross income, less their allocable deductions, including interest and taxes. And then on, on slide 15, I've identified some of the items of income that are excluded uh, from, from gross income for purposes of determining your guilty income. Uh, next slide. So when, once you've determined your net CFC tested income, you would then subtract your deemed tangible income return to determine the guilty inclusion. The net deemed tangible income return, as I mentioned, is going to be 10% of the tangible assets. And for guilty, it's also less the amount of any interest expense that's been taken into account in determining the net CFC tested income. And similar to subpart F, this, the guilty inclusion for C corporations will bring with it a deemed paid foreign tax credit, uh, but the foreign tax credit in the case of guilty will be taking a haircut. It's only 80% of the, of the otherwise available deemed paid taxes, while at the same time, the section 78 gross up remains at 100%. Uh, Interestingly, you know, the, the guilty provisions, I think, are, are going to be uh, very, you know, potentially very detrimental to uh, pass-through entities or individual shareholders. So I think, uh, you know, when you look at uh, individuals, shareholders, or, or like S-Corps partnerships, they're not eligible for the, for the uh, deemed paid foreign tax credit or the, you know, in, in no Section 78 gross up. And they also are not eligible for this 50% deduction of guilty income, which is only available to C-Corps. Uh, next slide. All right, so foreign-derived intangible income. As I mentioned, this provision is, is intended to encourage domestic C-Corps to generate foreign-derived intangible income. So FIDI is essentially the U.S. corporation's income in excess of its deemed tangible return attributable to the sale of property, in, including licenses and leases, uh, to foreign persons for use outside the U.S. or for the performance of services for foreign persons or with respect to property outside the U.S. The, the income of the U.S. corp that would not be taken into account in determining City would include, you know, other items already, you know, subject to, uh, you know, current tax under other regimes. So Part F income, the guilty income, uh, financial services income, dividends received from CFCs that are now you know, subject to the uh, territorial system, uh, domestic oil and gas extraction in income, and foreign branch income. 
Uh, next slide. So as, so as I mentioned, for, for U.S. C corps, the effective U.S. tax rates on FIDI and guilty are, are both accomplished by providing new deductions under Code Section 250. So the, for FIDI, the deduction is 37.5% through two, 2025, and after that, it's going to be reduced to 21.875%. This results in an effective U.S. tax rate on FIDI initially of this 13.125% through 2025. And for guilty, the deduction is 50% through 2025 and is then reduced to 37.5% after 2025. This results in an effective U.S. tax rate initially on guilty of 10.5% through 2025. It's also important to note that the deductions for FIDI and guilty are both subject to, to a taxable income limitation and may require a pro rata reduction of the deduction if, that, if the taxable limitation comes into play. Uh, next slide. All right, so here we've provided an example of a computation of the guilty inclusion in the residual U.S. tax. It's meant as a high-level view of how the calculation works. Um, a, a few takeaways on the guilty. Uh, because the reduced deemed paid foreign tax credit, guilty should generally not result in any residual U.S. tax if the CFC's foreign tax burden is, is roughly, you know, just, just above 13%. So, you know, 13% times the 80% deemed paid credit gets you close to this 10.5% tax rate that will apply on guilty income. So, again, the, the focus here on the guilty provision is to impose a minimum tax in the U.S. if the income is earned in a low tax context. However, it's, it's important to note that taxpayers' foreign tax credit position can also have a significant impact on its overall tax burden under the under the guilty provision. So, so some of the things that you're going to need to pay attention to would be, as I mentioned, you know, the taxable income limitation and how that impacts a, a, a potential reduction to the guilty deduction. Uh, the use of NOLs could, could negatively impact your tax burden relative to guilty. Uh, significant 861 expense allocations as well could impact your guilty FTC limitation. And then lastly, there's, there's also no carry forward or carry back of excess foreign tax credits in this separate guilty foreign tax credit, foreign tax credit limitation basket. So it's a use them or lose them, uh, you know, uh, approach within the guilty basket. Uh, next slide. All right, so over the next few slides, uh, what we've done is we've provided a, an example of how the FIDI calculation works. Uh, so there's a series of steps that you need to work through in, in uh, computing FIDI. A key aspect in the process is to determine the ratio of your foreign-derived deduction-eligible income in the U.S. company over its total deduction-eligible income. This ratio is then applied to your deemed intangible return to determine your FIDI. And then you would, you would then reduce your FIDI by this 37.5% deduction in computing your U.S. tax liability. So depending on the, the U.S. corporation's relative mix of, of FIDI or foreign derived activity over their total activity, they, they would expect the U.S. tax burden to be somewhere between this beneficial rate of 13.125% and the regular corporate tax rate of 21%. Uh, so if we move uh, Guy up to slide 23, kind of skipping over, if, if anyone has any questions on the calculation of the FIDI, then we, we can uh, you know, circle back to that at, at the end. All right, so the, the, the final provision that we wanted to cover is the new base erosion anti-abuse tax, or BEAT. Th this provision is intended to counter U.S. tax base erosion through excessive related party deductible payments 
and establishes a base erosion minimum tax amount that would be computed using a new modified taxable income. The base erosion minimum tax would be the excess, if any, of this 10% times your modified taxable income over your regular tax liability. And then, you know, there are some, some, some certain adjustments on computing regular tax liability for this purpose. The other thing is to note that the uh, the rate, the base erosion minimum tax rate for 2018 is only 5%. So for that, for the first you know year of this new regime, there's a, there's a lower tax rate. Um, and, and then the 10% rate will increase to 12.5% 12, 12 after 2025. So the, the base erosion tax benefits include most foreign related party payments. This includes interest, royalties, services, as well as the annual deductible amounts associated with acquisitions of depreciable or amortizable property. However, importantly, it excludes cost of goods sold. And for purposes of um, related party payments, uh, we're generally talking about 25% relatedness. Modified taxable income is, is generally going to be the income determined without regard to the deduction for the base erosion payments for the tax year and will also include uh, the base erosion percentage of any NOL deduction that's being claimed in the current year. Uh, so I think there's still going to be, uh, we're still gonna need some further guidance in particular on this NOL aspect of computing the modified taxable income, whether there's a uh, uh, whether this is only going to be dealing with new NOLs created from 2018 forward, or whether the you know NOLs created before 2018 will in some way impact uh, the, the, this modified tax base in years where those NOLs are being deducted, uh, and then. What, what entities are subject to the BEAT? So the BEAT will apply to domestic corporations other than S-Corps, RICs, and REITs, and that are part of MNE groups that have 500 million of annual domestic gross receipts over a three-year averaging period, and have a base erosion percentage of at least 3%, or, or a 2% in the case of banks and, and uh, registered security dealers. So the, the intended impact of the provision is, is, as Sim noted, is a rough 50-50 you know, split in taxing uh, these base eroding payments between the U.S. and the foreign jurisdiction. And that's roughly this, you know, this 10 percent, which you know, at, at one point was 50-50 you know, when the corporate rate was 20. It's kind of going up at the very end to 21 percent. Next slide. So here we've included an example of how the beat would apply to a taxpayer. And in this case, it's a, it's a U.S. sub with a foreign parent earning interest income and paying interest expense. So in this case, the, the, you know, the U.S. sub's earning 600 of interest income and making deductible payments, interest payments of 300 to the foreign parent and 100 to an unre unrelated bank. The base erosion payment in this example is 75%, which is the 300 of related party interest payments over the total deductible payments of 400. That gets you to the 75%. Uh, the regular tax liability for this taxpayer is $42, the $600 of interest income, $400 of interest deductions uh, times the 21% tax rate. And then we compare that regular tax liability of 42 to this new modified taxable income. The modified taxable income is going to be the gross income less only the deductions excluding the base erosion related party interest. So we've got modified taxable income of 500 times this 10% uh, deemed, uh, you know, the 10% um, rate on, on um, modified taxable income to come up with a $50 uh, well, min tax, less 
the regular tax liability of 42 gets us to this residual tax coming into play for this taxpayer uh, of $8. So to, so to recap before passing it back over to Sim, while U.S. tax reform has brought about significant reduction to the headline corporate rate to 21%, along with a shift to a territorial system, the new U.S. international provisions do include some significant base protection and broadening changes with the introduction of the new beat and guilty provisions. At the same time, the U.S. is looking to encourage U.S. activity, domestic corporate activity, by providing a reduced or preferential rate uh, for the export of goods and services under the new FITI provision. Uh, Sim will, will discuss how these changes may impact business models and some of the practical implications for businesses. Um, thank you, Kevin. Guy, if you, yeah, there we go. Um, with the remainder of time, what we'd like to do is focus on two things. One is to look at potential models of planning for outbound and inbound groups, and then go through a, a, a checklist that we found to be very effective in terms of organizing the re review processes of companies to, to take into account the issues that are ongoing. Mm -hmm. And it's important to emphasize, as Raymond did to start with, that this U.S. tax reform is very important, but it's only one of many um, considerations that are impacting the effective tax rates of multinationals. In U.S., as, as Kevin said, we have the new provision with low rates, new incentives, and new penalties. But we also have a variety of other considerations elsewhere in the world to be taken account of. Um, the European Union state aid and other proposals um, are very important as well. The, the BEPS action plans, as they're being in, implemented in various countries, have big impacts, of course, on um, permanent establishment issues, uh, potential utilization of profit splits, and an increased focus on risk assessment of companies um, to focus on uh, potential strategies for minimizing disputes that arise in the future. And perhaps for many groups, the most important incremental element to be taken into account in planning is the phenomenal evolution in how to tax digital businesses. Um, with the one-off proposals getting serious in several countries, uh, including deemed PE provisions, um, it's, it's a veritable shopping list of considerations that need to be taken into account in planning. So let's take a quick look at just the, uh, from an outbound and then an inbound standpoint of traditional planning and then what's likely to happen in the future, at least models to be considered for inbound and outbound groups. On slide 25, we have a, a picture of the traditional structure of outbound planning from a U.S. standpoint. And uh, as, as many of you listening know, the same picture could be applied if it's a outbound from Germany or Sweden or Japan or other country, just depending on the domestic uh, law. But the typical structure for outbound from the U.S. is reflected here in terms of a, a U.S. company at the top with equity and debt financed um, elements in between the U.S. group and a non-U.S. principal, which is typically an interim holding company um, in tax-efficient jurisdictions. And then underneath that, having uh, specific functional activities, here we just show contract R&D, contract manufacturing uh, services and, and related activities, distribution, whatever. If from a transfer pricing standpoint, of course, what we've always done in these contexts is to uh, typically want the principal company to be the, the risk taker, if you will, to earn the residual income and having the next tier of groups uh, earn returns on a one-sided transfer pricing methodology, either a TNMM or cost plus, so that the minimal return is earned in those countries with the residual going to the principal. As Kevin indicated, th this kind of planning is, of course, impacted by the guilty provision. And what it does is sort of 
if it's upheld to the inevitable challenges that come, is to say that we're going to ignore TNMM and cost plus type methodologies, and we're simply going to deem that anything that's earned in that lower tier that's greater than 10% of their um, fixed assets is a non routine return. And the same would then apply to the interim holding company, the US principal, as well as any other elements. And from a guilty testing standpoint, all of that is aggregated in terms of determining the amount of guilty income in the US. So as indicated at the bottom of slide 25, this model has typically pr provided a global effective tax rate for US-based companies of, uh, let's say, 20 to 25%, some cases more, sometimes less, just depending on the nature of the business. Guy, how about going to the next slide? Um, what's the future model going to look like? Well, who knows? Um, but, but it's likely to be a lot more simplified. Um, as indicated here with the interim holding company and then the models below. And in the box at the bottom of page 26, there's a, a brief calculation, again, of the guilty provisions. Um, now, the kind of considerations that will need to be taken into account by groups in terms of planning in light of the provisions that Kevin indicated, the, the FDII, the guilty, and the beat, and whatnot, um, Perhaps a critical question is, what is the stability of these regimes? And that is in planning on a go going forward basis, as we'll go through in a checklist in just a few minutes, um, it's important to take a patient approach and, and incrementalize um, evolutions in the effective tax rate planning over time. And in that regard, the stability of these re regimes is a question. And as I'm sure everybody's read in Financial Times or, or elsewhere, um, several countries and business groups have raised questions from a WTO standpoint or an EU law standpoint uh, as to whether or not, especially the FDII provisions are, are dis discriminatory um, in, in terms of penalizing um, certain kinds of activity. We'll see. But for all groups, a question will be, do we need to restructure our activities in one way or another? For example, if the FDII provisions are beneficial, that is with the effective 13.125 effective tax rate, what do we do? Um, of course, it's not realistically possible to simply move intellectual property assets from one country to another. Uh, for a variety of reasons, including exit taxes in those countries, as well as the local reaction of those countries to those movements. And, and we've all seen these issues in, in the OECD restructuring provisions of a couple years ago, um, as well as the proliferation of exit taxes in countries. But all of those things will need to be taken into account, um, and we'll go through some checklists of, of how to organize groups uh, to do their planning in the future. Um, Guy, if you go to the next slide. In terms of inbound operations, um, the chart looks simple um, as, as compared to the as-is of the outbound, but th this also reflects our experience in, in working with inbound groups in terms of global effective planning, and that is we have the non-U.S. parent company, we have the U.S. operations, and the typical approach has been to, um, again, you use normal transfer pricing arrangements and oftentimes between the non-U.S. parent and the U.S. operations, there would be an interim holding company. But in any event, the U.S. operations would be treated the same as the offshore distribution R&D manufacturing operations in the prior model in the sense of using normal transfer pricing rules to minimize the return of the U.S. entity, and then to utilize uh, what we now characterize as base erosion payments um, to further reduce the operating income from a taxable income um, standpoint. The base provision, of course, is intended to address this, and, and it'll need to be taken into account, um, and there are some fascinating questions there. Um, Guy, how about doing the next slide? 
Um, as Kevin indicated, wh when we look at the base, the beat provisions, um, it applies to interest, uh, royalties, uh, reinsurance premiums, and a variety of other things. But what it does not apply to is COGS. Um, and that, and that is, if the we have a U.S. distributor for foreign base manufacturer, the purchase of those goods is not subject to the beat tax. In the provision that was in the House of Representatives prior to the final bill, there was a, in essence, a, a very significant 20% uh, tax on those cost of goods sold payments. That that was deleted. But the the critical issue here from a planning standpoint and a future tax examination standpoint, I think is gonna become what is what is in COGS for beat purposes? And that is, as, as everyone on the, on the phone knows, if we look at the cost of goods sold for any company, it can include all kinds of different things. And it may be in the future that uh, subject to financial accounting rules, it'd be beneficial to include some other uh, items that would normally be operating uh, deductions for operating income purposes to be included in cost of goods sold. A lot of groups have payments in that cost of goods sold category that a tax authority might look at and think, well, those are really payments for the use of intangibles, so maybe we should segregate those. From a planning standpoint, I think it's important for companies to, to look at that kind of issue and begin thinking through um, what what do we categorize in COGS and what potential implications could it have with respect to this beat um, tax. And in working with clients so far, I, I find that as we go through all of the intercompany arrangements, there are all kinds of payments that we, we end up flagging to, to think, of, think them through and think about how they ought to be categorized in the future. The other element of the inbound planning, of course, is, is the impact of the uh, FDII incentive. And, and for many groups, you know, query, if we're gonna have an incremental operation, do we wanna put that into the United States in a way that qualifies the 13.125 effective tax rate? And for many countries today, uh, with their own territorial systems, there's either no tax on uh, repatriations or there's a minimum tax on repatriations. Um, so that whole planning regime is gonna become um, very interesting to work through in the future. Um, Guy, how about going to the next slide? So when, when we look through all the provisions that Raymond discussed from a high level and Kevin did from a practical level, you know, what, what are the takeaways and, and the practical implications of, of the U.S. tax reform? And we identify basically um, four on the slide and, and one I forgot to add. Um, one is the impact on effective tax rates of inbound and outbound multinationals. Second is the creation of new opportunities due to the tax policy incentives, particularly the low rates um, of 21% plus the FDII. And on the FDII, I think it's interesting to note that um, uh, the BEPS Action 5 has various criteria for a patent box. The FDII plainly does not meet those criteria, so it'll be interesting to see uh, what impact that has as well. I don't think it's the same kind of WTO issue, but uh, you never know. Um, third is all groups at least need to consider whether their business models need to be reset. And I, I at least have not looked at anything so far that there's not uh, issues and opportunities to be taken into account. And certainly when you're dealing with a materially reduced top line tax rate of 35 to 21%, that creates a benefit um, for most groups. And then the other elements are things to be taken into account either as offsets of that benefit or um, hopefully further uh, benefits getting down to that 13.125% um, rate. Um, fourth item is uh, simply driving uh, global compliance. It, it, uh, all groups now are, of course, dealing with the country-by-country country reporting issues, and 
Um, everyone, everyone now has had the experience of working within their companies, coming up the um, CBC report matrices in terms of filling out all those forms of, of people functions and the allocation of income. And, and we're all starting to think through, uh, how, okay, how do we deal with these issues from a uh, Depp's Dempy standpoint, a people issue of making sure the personnel and, and the functions are coordinate. Um, and that's just another element of restructuring or, or effective tax rate planning that needs to be taken into account, um, just like the U.S. Um, tax reform. The final thing I forgot to mention on here is that <clears throat> for many groups, uh, of course, we've been doing um, advanced pricing agreements and other kinds of tax agreements um, since time immemorial. Um, lots of our clients today are in generation five or six um, of, of those APAs. And, and for example, consider if we have an inbound to the U.S. group and, and we have an APA that let's just say has a let's say it's an inbound distributor that has a, a TNM, TNMM CPM methodology of four or five percent of sales um, what impact do the new provisions have and that is can we address the applicability of beat in that APA or can we address the reality of, of the guilty and FDII determination of uh, deemed intangible income I think those are all going to become issues in renewal or new APAs for all groups. Very interesting. Um, the final thing I'd like to do is, uh, Guy, if you could go to the next page. Um, as, as we in um, TPA and, and its members have worked through these issues with our clients, we've always found it to be effective to at least start with a checklist of what what are the things we need to take into account as we assess our effective tax rate planning. Um, prior to the U.S. tax reform, we did this often uh, partly and sometimes in dispute resolution, sometimes in planning, um, sometimes in, in developing a, a value chain model that uh, provides maximum compliance with the BEPS type issues and anticipating CBC and making sure that we're, we're getting the group into the best possible position we can for um, addressing inevitable tax authority challenges. But in this checklist, we, we try to highlight the things that um, a, a, a group would take into account in figuring out how are we going to structure our process of re reviewing not just the U.S. tax reform, but the other considerations we mentioned. Um, so I'll just go through it real, real quickly, and uh, then we'll have time for questions. From a formation of the working group standpoint, one question, especially if, if it relates to the U.S., is just, do we want to have attorney-client privilege surrounding that process? And, of course, that's an important issue because as we do these working group evolutions, modeling becomes an important part of it, and uh, we certainly would not all would not want all of those modeling exercises uh, to be subject to uh, being turned over in the event of tax examinations. <clears throat> then just the financial accounting due diligence, uh, I'll just go through these quickly. Um, CBC documentation is, is, excuse me, essentially done for all groups at this point. And the key I've always found in doing these uh, working group exercises is developing the modeling. And that is start with that base case as we did for outbound and inbound, and then model the changes we want to take into account, um, whether it's for U.S. tax reform, BEPS, or digital, or anything else. Next is, is to, once we've isolated the impact of CBC and the modeling, to revisit the building blocks of the effective ta tax rate plan we had. And, and for U.S. groups, of course, those building blocks were as we showed on that as-is model. So you need to take that, those building blocks and figure out how do we update them in a way that's uh, reasonable. Guy, if you go to the next page. Um, then we develop recommendations going forward. And uh, my experience is that um, there's sort of three paths for going forward. 
One is to do nothing. Um, and that is do the modeling, do the looking at it, uh, recognize that, that there's opportunities in the U.S. There may be risks of in the digital context or state aid context or diverted profits tax, wherever they may be. But it may well be the best course at this point is let's be patient and let's see how all of these things play out in the future. Um, but then second approach is to what I would call incrementalize, and that is um, as incremental acquisitions, uh, development projects, or otherwise come up, why don't we implement those in a way that is going to help us on the CBC kind of <clears throat> people function issue, as well as maybe qualify for the new incentives in the U.S. Next, of course, if we're going to do some, or third alternative is to do a, a, a restructuring. And if we do that, then at the bottom of slide 31 is, is simply a laundry list of the types of things we need to take into account in assessing that. And Guy, if you go to page 32. <coughs> um, and then finally, if we're, if we're going to do whatever it is, we have to have management review, implementation. And the final thing I wanted to mention was <coughs> what I would call home country tax authority coordination. As I said, for many groups, um, almost all groups, big groups anyway, we have new or, or contemplate getting APAs as appropriate for the group. One approach that I think increasingly may make sense for companies is what I would call home country, uh, a home country global tax agreement. And that is, if it's a German group or a Japanese group or a US group, with all the proliferation of unilateral systems around the world, does it make sense now to go to the government and suggest um, a new type of global uh, tax agreement, in essence saying, if I'm a multinational talking to my tax authority, um, we will incrementally locate as many activities domestically as we can, but in return for that, uh, what we'd like is, is a global tax agreement so that we can, in effect, get a, a <clears throat> foreign tax credit in the home country, regardless of what kind of one-off taxes uh, we may incur around the world. Um, Raymond, let me with that. Let me go back to you and uh, and Guy. And do we have some questions to answer? No, I think there is, as Sim says, um, you know, quite some change happening on the U.S. side. I have seen already clients who are significantly changing the concept of their model in the U.S. <coughs> I think Mr. Trump is reaching, in certain instances, his goal that these companies are actually considering building up more presence and more activities and allocating more uh, functionality into the U.S. to effectively avoid beat, as a, which seems to be really a penalty in their case. So I would expect uh, many more companies to change uh, in that sense. Uh, also, the territorial system with all the impacts of guilty uh, and FDII for U.S. companies will have potential impact on how people are structuring their organizations. So. Uh, uh, I think the last thing is that we can be of support there uh, in terms of uh, doing a proper value chain and analytics, understanding where people are, and then doing the financial analysis on top of that. Uh, and with the support of uh, Sim and Kevin in the U.S., we can ever we can actually very very well uh, support your organization uh, also on the U.S. side and doing the U.S. analytics. Um, I think with that, uh, Gaia, uh, and if we have no questions, I would like to close and thank everybody for their attention, for the registrations. Uh, thank Kevin, thank Sim for your support. And uh, if people have any questions, uh, this, um, this presentation, as well as the recording, will be on our website, accessible for everybody. And obviously, if you have any questions, you can email the people you see on the screen with their, um, with their email addresses and also their telephone numbers. With that, thank you very much and have a great evening.